Archbishop Mannix was Australia's most famous churchman, its most famous Irishman, one of its great troublemakers. As Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne from the First World War to the 1960s, he was a tribal leader and a political figure as much as a spiritual leader. A very public figure, equally loved and hated, but privately an enigma. The real Archbishop Mannix from the sources, reveals Mannix through his own words, his own actions, and the actions taken against him. Even before he was invested as Archbishop in 1917, Mannix repeatedly opposed Prime Minister Billy Hughes on the issue of conscription. I wanted to win the war. I wanted to promote voluntary enlistment and I did not want conscription. I considered that the Australian people, the soldiers who freely enlisted, were doing it and doing very well. Billy Hughes led a vicious campaign attacking Mannix as disloyal, a friend of Germany, virtually a traitor. In March 1918, Archbishop Mannix used the slogan, Australia First, with a suggestion that loyalty to Australia was an alternative to imperial loyalty. Rightly putting Australia first and the empire in its proper place. On his way to Rome to call on the Pope, Mannix arrives in San Francisco on the 7th of June 1920. He wastes no time in making inflammatory remarks about the English. On his way to New York City, he addressed the Catholic Summer School at Plattsburgh, New York. England was your enemy. She is your enemy today. She will be your enemy for all time. There is no use mincing words. Ireland is ruled by an alien government. Mannix and Sinn Féin President Amon de Valera were guests at a rally at Madison Square Garden that 15,000 people attended to hear Mannix speak. It is a long way from Melbourne to New York, but if it were ten times as long, I should have travelled every step of it in order to witness the demonstration of love and affection that you have made for the President of the Irish Republic. If our President here, President de Valera, if he had gone over to the Paris Conference, where these great plenipotentiaries were assembled in secret conclave, and if he had been asked against whom Ireland had a complaint, if he were able to answer that Ireland's grievance was against Germany, the doors would have been flung open to him. He would have been invited to take a chair at the head of the table, next to your own president. Max's personal relationship with the extreme Irish Republican de Valera was one of the closest of his life and came close to hero worship. He said later, And so it went down until God in his providence sent to Ireland Ireland's man of destiny, Eamon de Valera. For the British, Mannix's 1920 speech and his planned visit to Ireland were major threats to public order. They had had enough. Even as Mannix spoke, Strong rumours were circulating that the British government would intervene during the next phase of his overseas tour and thwart his plan to cross the Atlantic and land at Cork. Two days after Mannix sailed on the RMS Baltic, it was decided that Mannix would be arrested at sea and removed from the Baltic to be detained on the Royal Navy destroyer HMS Wyvern until he could be landed. 
Should you enter Ireland in contravention of this order, the military authorities have instructions to take steps immediately with a view to your removal. Signed by the Secretary of State for Home Affairs. Mannix was landed at Penzance. Mannix arrives in London. The Director of Intelligence, Scotland House London, sent a copy of the arresting officer's report, with his own report, of the arrival of Mannix at Penzance, saying, On landing, he took an early opportunity of being photographed and filmed at Penzance, and some 30 reporters had an interview with him at Plymouth. He seems quite to enjoy the limelight. Back home, Prime Minister Billy Hughes denounced Mannix, Dr. Mannix goes out for what he is. He is a Sinn Féiner. He is a man who, in the garb of a priest, has carried the baton of a political agitator. He has used his high position for that purpose. Mannix never again gained the limelight on the world stage as he had when the British landed him at Penzance. But back in Australia, his 50 years as tribal leader of Melbourne's Catholics showed a unique flair. The annual St. Patrick's Day processions saw the master showman stage a spectacle for and with his flock. The Vatican urged him. The office of pastor is primarily to restore harmony among souls, to reduce discord, but politics was rarely far below the surface. <laughs> Mannix on a regular visit to the Little Sisters of the Poor Hostel for the Aged, 1940s. Mannix, here with the workers at Broken Hill in 1922, was a theorist of social justice. Mannix put his political hopes in the Labour Party and its Catholic leaders. In extreme old age, Mannix pursued his crusade against communism, even to the extent of provoking a massive split in the Labour Party. As always, he was unrepentant. Now, these were instances of direct intervention in a political campaign. Do you think an archbishop has a right, or how do you see the right, rather, of an archbishop to come so. out and say this? I think that when a man becomes a bishop, he doesn't cease to be a citizen.